Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to eDiscovery Leaders Live, sponsored by Reveal and hosted by ACEDS. I am George Sosha, Senior Vice President of Brand Awareness at Reveal. Each Friday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern, I host an episode of this program where I get a chance to chat with luminaries in the e-discovery field and related areas. Today, my guest is Ron Tienzo. Ron is a senior consultant at Construction Discovery Experts. <clears throat> he specializes in helping clients use cutting edge machine learning, artificial intelligence, advanced analytics, and custom workflows to handle complex and large scale litigation. Music to my ears. <laughs> Throughout his career, Ron has provided strategic discovery consulting to mid-sized corporations, as well as to one third now of the Fortune 100 at both the state and the federal level. Before joining construction discovery experts, Ron was among other things, director of search and analytics at Catalyst Repository Systems. And while he was there, he was instrumental in the development of Catalyst's predictive coding technology. He also worked as a consultant at Legality and as a trainer at the uh, uh, Liner Law Firm. Ron has a JD from the University of Denver, Strum College of Law. Ron, welcome to today's session. Thank you, George. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And, and I to have you here because <laughs> Two reasons. One, you've got a very specific focus that we're going to talk about today, construction litigation, yeah. which has its own challenges and nuances, and I'd like to make sure we cover those. Absolutely. And second, you are doing your best to push the boundaries and the borders of the use of artificial intelligence in litigation, in discovery, and in particular with discovery in construction litigation. So let's start with the construction industry. What are some of the sure. things that are unique about construction litigation? Well, as you had mentioned uh, before, I was doing a lot of class action work, a lot of DOJ second requests, huge data sets with a very small sliver of responsiveness. But now that I'm working in construction, I realize it's no longer the needle in the haystack. Now we have these huge multi-gigabyte, terabyte construction servers where most of it is responsive or gener generally responsive, and we end up producing it. So what is the role of AI in that when you are dealing with a 90% responsive population? And it's really flipping AI on its head, noticing that, all right, I have a barn full of haystacks. What do I need to cut out? And then we start using AI to find things like confidentiality or privilege or hot documents. There's still a lot of use cases even beyond the typical, I'm gonna cull, review and produce. So that reminds me the first part at least of the perhaps apocryphal story about the carving of the statue of David and chipping away chunks mm -hmm. of marble until the statue emerged as if it were always hiding inside there waiting to be, uh, uh, sorry for this, revealed. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you doing in particular, and especially with AI, to cut away those chunks? So, uh, and, and George, and, and to everyone out there, George gave me a license to bring my own visual aids. I know this is uh, episode five here. Um, so here we go. This is my, fa my favorite AI uh, article that came this week. Onions banned from Facebook for being too sexy. And I will tell you, this will relate to your question in just a second. So what happened is Facebook's AI engine thought that this image was uh, inappropriate and it was flagged to much the chagrin of the farmer who tried to post it. And uh, the problem is, is that we are relying on AI that it wasn't built specifically for our clients' needs. This was a generalized AI image recognition engine, and it wasn't used to seeing a bunch of onions. In fact, if it was used to seeing onions, it was more like, you know, cover up your onions. Um, 
So how does this relate to discovery, uh, construction discovery? Well, we're seeing a lot of the generalized AI models don't fit. Um, being that it's construction, uh, oftentimes people talk with more crass language than they would in the office as they do on the construction site. So for our clients, we run a generalized AI engine that's looking for crass language, um, overtly sexual content, because we want to get that in front of our attorneys before it goes out the door. Uh, so we ran this generalized engine, and these are the top two hot documents that came up for overtly sexual content. You'll notice that uh, it mentions butt joint and pipe nipple. Now, if this were in a different context, yes, you should flag those. But if my AI really understood construction and understood construction terms, it wouldn't weigh those as heavily. And I really think that's where the evolution of machine learning and e-discovery is going. We've, we've come to this acceptance that AI can help us get to the root of relevant information. Now it's how can we custom fit AI so we're not starting from ground zero or using something that was made for someone else to understand how my clients or how my corporation communicates. And that's what we're doing with our construction clients is building customized AI that understands the unique nature of construction law and, and using that to, to help um, carve away the marble and reveal the, the statue of David. What what then is what's the customization that makes this possible? So it's really utilizing um, your attorney work product. Um, so I have another example here. Everybody familiar with these? These are the captchas that uh, Google put together, and it's a way for us to prove that we are not artificial intelligence. We're not robots. And what a lot of people don't know is it started off here where it was, uh, you had to type the text. And what Google was doing in the background is they were using this to enhance their OCR engine because at the time they were OCRing a lot of historical documents. Um, but then Google Maps came out. So then the capture changed to this where you started identifying street signs. And then it evolved to this where now you're starting to look at traffic lights and other uh, traffic related items. and what they're doing now is using this human coding to better create AI engines and to test that their AI engines are working effectively. Because Google understands that human coding is invaluable and it's costly and it's necessary for AI to evolve. So every opportunity Google gets, they're going to collect that data and try to use a lot, utilize it to improve their AI engines. We need to start doing that in e-discovery. So often machine learning has been, okay, we, we got our case, let's turn on our AI engine, start from document one until we reach our stopping point and then throw that model away. New case come in, comes in, we start at document one until the end, throw that model away. But human coding, especially attorney coding that's $400, $500 an hour is invaluable. So what we're encouraging our clients to do is to leverage that information that you gain from that one case and be able to utilize it across multiple cases, whether it's issue coding or confidentiality or privilege, there is a, a common thread throughout how your corporation operates day to day. So we're trying to leverage that information to make better AI models. Two questions on that. First, just how do you leverage that? And second, <clears throat> we'll use this as a placeholder and come back. What do you do with um, anonymization or pseudonymization of that content if that's necessary? So the first, how, mm -hmm. how do you accomplish this? So those are both great questions. And that really walks the line of AI is where do we factor in privacy uh, as well as uniqueness and quality control? And those are all aspects that need to be figured out. So your first question, how do we do it? Well, it's working with a tool that has a portable model, meaning once I, my case is over, I still have ownership of that model and can apply it somewhere else. And over the course of time, my one case of 100,000 decisions becomes 10 cases of a million decisions. And that AI model now becomes custom built to understand my corporation or my caseload. 
Now, anonymization. So what eventually I think we can get to a point of anonymization, uh, but we're not there yet. The technology is not there yet. So m what I have been promoting is within uh, an organization of itself. So we don't use the same model for every construction company. We have a client specific model for each. So <clears throat> do you have then if um, two layers of models, some that can be used from client to client to client, and some, I gather, that are specific just to one client. Right now, we're just to one client. Now, um, so we use the NextLP uh, in, in a lot of our cases, and NextLP has generalized models that we can enhance. Um, but again, we're striking that balance of, are we enhancing it with proprietary information from our corporation? And then, what is the possibility of that information getting out? Um, so for the most part, when we are talking about relevance, when we are talking about privilege, we are using core specific models. If we're talking about generalized subjects, like I don't want butt joint to be flagged for every um, sexually inexplicit um, model that we have, then we can use more generalized terms. And I mean, really, to break down AI and machine learning, and most of the people on this chat know this, is yes, it's complicated, but if we break it down to its core elements, we're really talking about terms and weighted scores. So our ability to export those term lists and those weighted scores allows us to be able to propagate those models to other cases. And really that's what we're trying to extract and utilize for our clients. How, <clears throat> excuse me, how complex is it? You've got bespoke models that you're delivering mm -hmm. to specific clients. How complicated is it to build one of those bespoke models? Um, so I can't speak for every tool. A lot of it is tool dependent on how easy the tool makes it to be portable and you know who really has ownership of that model once it's created. Assuming that you're using a tool that's flexible, uh, like NextLP, uh, it, it's not hard. It, it's essentially going through and using that, exporting that model at the end of your review and then applying it again. And let me, let me be transparent here. We're not talking about a magic bullet. You know, no model is going to be perfect and every case is going to be slightly different, but it's much better than starting off at ground zero. Um, you know, every year Amazon doesn't flush my shopping history so they can build a new model for me because it knows there's valuable data that's being accumulated. And that's what we're trying to leverage. What is the reaction from the attorneys and support staff you work with at law firms to this approach? So it has been generally in a positive one. Um, so you know, for the longest time in this industry, we were fighting the uphill battle of machine learning it can help save you. You don't have to look at every document. Um, this has been an easier topic to digest just because we're not saying it's the end all be all. We're saying that these are tools that are going to help you protect the information that you don't want released. And Know, miss a few responsive documents or overproduce, and that's part of the business. But when you start accidentally producing privilege or confidential, confidential documents or proprietary information, uh, when you start speaking that language, it's much more palatable to talk about these bespoke uh, machine learning models. Is the reaction similar or different when it is folks in-house that you're dealing with? And, and corporate or governmental legal departments? It, it tends to be the same. Um, just because, uh, again, the, the subject matter. You know, I, I think that's a great question in that you know, we are not taking work away from anybody. What we're really doing is highlighting the most critical content that we, we're trying to protect. And I think everybody wants to do that, whether you are in the GC's office or outside counsel or you know, a government ag agency. I, I tend to think of the use of these technologies, the AI technologies, and a number of uh, ones around them, um, machine learning, natural language processing, those various different pieces, <clears throat> is falling into two broad camps. 
The first are the investigative capabilities, and, and a significant subset of that is tell me something I don't know. Mm-hmm. And then the second are the predictive coding, TAR, predictive analytics, whatever you want to call it, capabilities. And I think of those as find more of this. Yeah. It sounds as if these models and the approach you're taking can be used for both sets of approaches. Is that right? That's, that's a great point. Uh, so right, I've been framing this conversation in the, all right, new litigation comes, let's apply this model. Uh, but there's a lot of a investigatory uh, concepts that are involved with this. Um, let's say uh, you are doing an internal investigation or trying to prove a negative. You can build a model that you can operate within your corporate environment to identify these records. Or if you are a, um, a retailer, you don't deal with a lot of huge you know, multi-jurisdictional cases, but you have a lot of human resources uh, matters. Well, build a model that specifically looks for the most relevant documents within your human resources model, uh, human resources matters. With the idea that, you know, the more information I can get, if I know that this case falls into this category and I, I handled it this way in the past, leveraging that information is going to take so much stress off of your in-house counsel and be able to be far more strategic in how we handle these low value, high occurrence type of claims. So one last question before I turn it to you for final thoughts. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, there is going to be a question about cost and whether this is more expensive, less expensive, or equally as expensive as (laughs) other approaches. What has been your experience? So, this has always been a sticking point in our industry is what is the upfront cost versus the long-term cost. Thankfully to say that the upfront cost has already been paid. It was your dollar, it was your client's dollars and cents that went to pay for these attorneys to review them for the technology to host them. So the model is created from that. Um, what is the associated cost? I would say it's really minimal. Uh, we're using the very similar technology and using you know information that's already been gained. We're just trying to re-leverage it somewhere else. So not only do we tick the it's efficient, but we also tick the it's cost effective. So uh, that that's my plea to the community. Like, hey, let's start doing this. Let's start using AI bigger than the, the case that's right in front of us. Well, that sounds like a great pitch. So final <laughs> comments from, and thoughts from you, something I missed, something you'd like to highlight? Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for for, for having me here. Uh, I do have one last thought, and this is more relevant to 2020. Um, hey, everybody, let's hang in there. Nobody expected this year to be the way it is. Take care of yourself. Call your loved ones. Make sure they're doing okay, and we'll all get through this together. So, George. I really appreciate the time here. Ron, thanks very much. My guest this week was Ron Tienzo. Ron is a senior consultant at Construction Discovery Experts. Thanks very much, Ron. Thanks.